undermine Obamacare. Obamacare may have survived another Republican repeal effort, but the Trump administration can still take steps to weaken it. The administration for months has taken steps to undercut the Affordable Care Act independent from Congress. Friday's collapse of Senate Republicans' slim-down repeal bill could push President Donald Trump to escalate those efforts, possibly by taking aim at the law's individual mandate. As I said from the beginning, let Obamacare implode, then deal. Watch. Trump tweeted after the GOP's so-called skinny repeal bill went down in flames. Among Trump's options is unilaterally cutting off billions of dollars in crucial subsidy payments to insurers, funding seen as necessary to keep the law's insurance markets afloat. The administration so far has paid the subsidies, which total about $7 billion this year, on a month-to-month -month basis. But insurers fear Trump could make good on past threats to cut them off, possibly to force Democrats to negotiate on health care. Here are some of Trump's other options, nixing the individual mandate, the mandate requiring most Americans to have health insurance or pay a tax penalty is easily the most unpopular piece of the 2010 health law. Only Congress can strike the mandate, but many viewed the executive order Trump issued on his first day in office instructing agencies to weaken Obamacare as a sign to stop enforcing the penalties. The mandate hasn't convinced enough young and healthy people to buy insurance, but health plans see it as a crucial tool to keep markets stable. Without it, premiums could unexpectedly spike or carriers could exit markets altogether, accelerating a trend that began this year. Cutting enrollment outreach, weeks after taking power, the Trump administration canceled $5 million in healthcare.gov ads at the end of the previous enrollment season a move the law's supporters said prevented enrollment gains, especially among younger Americans. That trend could continue for the upcoming enrollment season that begins November 1 and further hamper signups. The Department of Health and Human Services has already decided to terminate at the end of August two contracts for programs aimed at signing up people for insurance across the country. The administration could also pair millions in federal funding for other outreach, the Obama administration awarded $63 million in grants to nonprofits last September to help states bolster enrollment efforts, and another trench of funding is supposed to be released by this fall. To date, the Trump administration hasn't signaled whether it would continue it. Letting red states enact coverage limits, conservative activists incensed with the Senate's doomed repeal vote are already prodding the administration to loosen Obamacare's coverage mandates and give states more flexibility to skirt federal regulations. There are several actions the Trump administration and Congress should take right now to help ease Obamacare's burden on millions of hard-working Americans, increase access to health care, especially for those most in need, and give patients more control. Freedom Partners Nathan Nascimento said in a statement Friday. HHS is expected to give Republican states much wider latitude to limit who can sign up for Medicaid, especially in those states that expanded their programs under Obamacare. Arizona, Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine and Wisconsin are among the states with Republican governors seeking federal permission to add work requirements or make able-bodied adult beneficiaries pay more out-of-pocket for care. The Obama administration largely shunned similar requests, arguing they would discourage people from enrolling. At least one state is seeking the Trump administration's permission to significantly overhaul Obamacare's rules for private insurance to attract insurers back to its struggling marketplace. Iowa, which is at risk of having no insurer sell coverage statewide next year, wants to scrap Obamacare's subsidies helping customers pay for premiums and medical bills and replace them with a limited tax credit. That could leave lower income and sick enrollees to pay a lot more for coverage. Making it harder to sign up, Obamacare saw one of its worst moments in the fall of 2013 when the healthcare.gov enrollment website crashed making it impossible to sign up for insurance. The website now functions virtually glitch-free, but only after the Obama administration put years of effort into trigging problems and making it more customer-friendly. Obama officials added online capacity during key enrollment deadlines when traffic swelled, 
boosted customer service staff to help people in queues and even left the enrollment windows open past deadlines if people hadn't finished. The Trump administration could opt out of any such efforts, further tamping down on enrollment. Scaramucci sets off on the record debate. White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci, whose obscenity laden tirade against fellow Trump administration officials during an interview with a New Yorker writer continued to reverberate on Friday, either learned a hard lesson in the basics of dealing with reporters or knew exactly what he was doing. Regardless, Scaramucci's phone call to the New Yorker's Ryan Le on Thursday caused a debate over what was or is off the record versus on the record and whether Scaramucci knew the difference. The phone call started because of an inquiry by Politico, which reached out to Scaramucci to confirm whether a dinner between Scaramucci, President Donald Trump, former Fox News executive Bill Shine and current Fox News hosts Sean Hannity and Kimberly Guilfoyle had taken place at the White House on Wednesday evening. Scaramucci asked who had revealed the information, and was pointed to Le, who had tweeted that the information came from an anonymous high-level White House source. Scaramucci then called Le and embarked on the strange tirade where, in extremely colorful language, he maligned his co-workers Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, detailed his conversations with the president and suggested that Priebus would soon be asked to resign. Scaramucci initially seemed to imply that the conversation was not meant to be public. I made a mistake in trusting in a reporter. It won't happen again, he tweeted Thursday evening. Hannity, a close friend of Scaramucci's and his dinner guest the night of the call, said on his program on Thursday that Scaramucci told me he thought it was off the record. But Lynn and the New Yorker say the information was not off the record. They say they have a recording of the conversation but do not plan to release the audio. The New Yorker said in a statement first reported by Axios that at one point in the conversation, Scaramucci requested that one part be off the record, and we respected that. The rest was on the record. Today, Thursday, Ryan and Scaramucci had another conversation and Scaramucci was clear and agreed that the conversation was on the record. By common understanding, Government officials and other sources who wish to keep their comments off the record must say so in advance in agreement with a reporter. In an interview on Fox News on Thursday, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders did not suggest that Scary Musai's conversation was off the record. Look, I think Anthony put out a statement here just moments ago, and stated that, you know, this is a guy who sometimes uses colorful and in many circles probably not appropriate language, Sanders said. And he's very passionate about the president and the president's agenda, and I think he may have let that get the best of him in that conversation. Asked by reporters on Air Force One about the interview, Scaramucci took on a decidedly more Washingtonian tone. Better not to comment, he said. Democrats strategize path to relevance with working-class whites Democrats leading House Super PAC assembled party strategists in Washington Thursday to deliver a sobering message and a call to arms, working-class white voters, once a key piece of the party's base, no longer trust them to improve the economy, and Democrats have to start addressing specific concerns about jobs and wages now in order to win some of them back in 2018. The briefing delivered by House Majority PAC Executive Director Charlie Kelly and Democratic pollsters Pete Brodnitz and Gil Normington in a basement conference room at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers headquarters, was equal parts reality check and hopeful look forward for Democrats. President Donald Trump may be struggling in national polls, but that has not given congressional Democrats a boost among whites without college degrees, the presenters warned. Hillary Clinton got 29% of the vote among non-college whites in the 2016 elections, according to exit polls, and generic Democratic congressional candidates got just 33% in a new House majority PAC poll of working-class whites in battleground House districts shared with Politico. Republican incumbents got 43%, Trump's approval rating, currently in the low 40s among all voters was 52% among working-class whites in House Majority PAC's poll.
but the early summer survey of 1,000 non-college white voters in House battlegrounds also highlighted support for Democratic candidates who proposed policies on jobs and the economy, especially ones incentivizing companies to hire American and promoting job training programs. The pollsters stressed that Democrats ought to lay out specific plans to help working-class swing voters and rebuild lost credibility with them on economic issues, instead of targeting bogeymen like big corporations. We suffer from the lack of an identifiable positive agenda, Broadnitz and Normington wrote in their presentation of the research. Without it, voters will turn to Trump for progress. With it, we can make significant gains. It may make the difference between a good 2018 election and another disappointing one for Democrats. Party strategists are increasingly of the belief that the House majority could be up for grabs next year. But the clearest path includes a large swath of heavily working-class districts in the Northeast and Midwest, where Democrats struggled in 2016 and recent midterm elections. In Iowa's two GOP-held battleground districts, Long considered key ingredients of a potential Democratic House majority, non college whites comprised 49% and 37% of the electorate in the last midterm, according to House Majority PAC data. In upstate New York, where freshman Republican Rep. John Faso is one of Democrats' top targets, 44% of midterm voters are non college whites. In Minnesota, House Democrats must defend three seats that are majority working class white. Even in places where more whites have college degrees, a group that has been giving Democrats more and more votes, in districts like freshman GOP Rep. Jason Lewis south of the Twin Cities in Minnesota, Democrats still may not be able to win if they keep losing working class whites by similar margins. While working class whites lean toward Republicans, they say Democrats are more likely to take the right approach on health care, House Majority PAC's poll found, a potentially important advantage amid the current health care fight in Congress. But the group also said Republicans are more likely to help improve the economy and create jobs by a huge 35-point margin, and almost no one who gave the GOP the advantage on that statement said they would vote for a Democrat for Congress in 2018. House Majority PAC is arguing for a specific focus on jobs and the economy to close that gap in credibility. While a majority of working-class white voters describe themselves as pro-choice on abortion, when asked about budget issues, more said they were concerned about infrastructure spending than funding for Planned Parenthood, Broadnitz and Normington said. Their polling showed that in addition to long-standing Democratic policy planks like expanding Social Security and protecting Medicare, working-class whites would be especially receptive to candidates who propose rewarding companies that hire American workers with tax breaks and funding job training programs. Spending on roads and other infrastructure projects was also a big positive with working-class whites. If we're going to make a play for the House, this is the stuff we need to talk about said Kelly, the House Majority PAC executive director. The poll showed Democrats moving into a tie in the generic congressional ballot after respondents heard about Democratic jobs plans, and even moving ahead after hearing attacks on Republicans seeking to end Medicare as we know it and the GOP's Obamacare repeal bills. The trick for Democrats will be actually getting working-class white voters to hear and believe those messages though early signs suggest the party is invested in making it happen. The presentation Thursday echoed Congressional Democrats' rollout of their new Better Deal slogan and policies focused on boosting jobs and wages. But the research is also the latest addition in a longer-term House Majority PAC project that started before the stunning election results in November 2016. Earlier that year, the Super PAC's polling led it to conclude against the prevailing wisdom among Democrats, that the party's national focus on college affordability was out of step with the beliefs and hopes of working-class white voters, many of whom did not see college as a guaranteed or even necessary step toward economic success. That clashes with progressives who have pushed to make free college a central piece of the Democratic platform in the wake of Bernie Sanders' grassroots-fueled 2016 presidential bid. But Broadnitz and Normington found that of all the candidate narratives tested in their latest poll of working-class whites, 
the one most likely to convince respondents to back a Democrat for Congress was the argument that people need to understand that not everyone goes to college and instead make sure that skilled workers have the training they need. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has been the target of multiple attacks in recent weeks from President Donald Trump. Embattled Attorney General Jeff Sessions said Friday that law enforcement work is often thankless, a remark that comes as he has been under withering criticism from his one-time ally, President Donald Trump. And while there are good days and bad days in any job, one thing has been clear to me. It is a privilege to serve one's country in law enforcement to wake up each morning and fight the fight for the rule of law," Sessions said Friday at a graduation ceremony for the International Law Enforcement Academy in El Salvador. It is hard work and often thankless, but the right to be safe in your community is the right on which all the others are based. Sessions has been the target of multiple attacks in recent weeks from Trump who has grown increasingly vocal with his frustration over the Attorney General's decision to recuse himself from the FBI's Russia investigation, a move that paved the way for a sprawling special counsel probe. Last week, the President told the New York Times that he would not have nominated Sessions to be Attorney General had he known the former Alabama senator would recuse himself. More recently, Trump has characterized his attorney general as beleaguered and wondered online why Sessions had not more thoroughly investigated 2016 Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders this week said that the president is disappointed in Sessions but has no immediate plans to replace him. The attorney general's Friday comments were not explicitly linked to Trump's recent criticisms. But Sessions told Fox News Tucker Carlson in an interview Thursday that the president's attacks have been kind of hurtful. But the president of the United States is a strong leader. Trump on health care it's going to be fine. President Donald Trump on Friday waved off questions about the failure of his party's last-ditch attempt at repealing the Affordable Care Act, telling reporters that it's going to be fine. Trump was responding to shouted questions from reporters as he exited Air Force One on Friday afternoon on Long Island, where he is scheduled to give his first public remarks since the Senate voted down the GOP skinny Obamacare repeal proposal. The measure failed 49-51, with all Senate Democrats and independents and three Republicans voting against it. Senator John McCain's no vote surprised party leaders. And despite the efforts of Vice President Mike Pence and a personal phone call from Trump, McCain wouldn't budge. Congress advised it has authority to undo any transgender military ban. If President Donald Trump follows through on his declaration to ban all transgender military personnel, Congress could delay or even undo it, according to a new analysis from the legislative branch's research arm. Trump. In a series of three tweets earlier this week, said that transgender men and women would not be allowed to serve in the ranks in any capacity. The snap announcement took Pentagon leaders and members of Congress by surprise and sparked an immediate bipartisan backlash. While some House Republicans were seeking to limit health care benefits for transgender troops, no lawmakers were calling for outright abolition. Transgender individuals were permitted to serve openly a year ago while the Pentagon took a year to study how to begin accommodating new recruits, or so-called accessions. That study was recently delayed six months. President Trump's tweets indicate that the accession policy changes that would have allowed transgender individuals to join the military are no longer under consideration, according to the new Congressional Research Service paper, first obtained by the Federation of American Scientists. The tweets also imply that there will be a change to the 2016 policy allowing transgender members currently in the military to continue to serve. Given this announcement, Congress may wish to consider the potential effects of the policy shift and whether to take legislative action in response. It adds, Congress may draft legislation to affect such administration policy, under its authority to make laws governing the armed forces.